But what you've done is, what we've all done is we've all seen, we've all, we've all fallen short. Yes. So the, the question is, are we ready to come back to them wholeheartedly? See, this week the government have come out and they've put it out on their website that it would be a good idea that people would start to make rations control for themselves and their families just in case something bad happens. I'm talking about Jesus. The church didn't save my soul, Jesus did. The Bible says, in Christ we have a hope in the future, so that no matter what happens here, you can smile because you're not Jesus. That's what the Bible says. But what you've done is, what we've all done is we've all sinned, we've all, we've all fallen short. Yeah. So the, the question is, are we ready to come back to him wholeheartedly and know him? How? How? Well, the Bible. Ethan, do you want to tell them how? Repent and put your trust in Jesus. How? How? So repentance is, if me and you were walking that way, and it's heading down a bad way. It's yeah. a bad way down there. Repentance is to say, actually, let's go back that way. So we're going away from God in our sin, to the spiritualist, to whatever we're doing. No one's good, everyone's got different things. God calls us to turn on that way. Not literally going that way, I'm, this is metaphorical. And, there we go. and turn to Christ, so that your sins can be washed away and forgiven. It, well, it's as simple as this, right? There's two thieves at the side of Jesus in the Bible. I'll give you a Bible if you haven't got one. There's two thieves at the side of Christ, right? When he's being crucified for you and for you, if you believe it or not, he did it. I do. Uh, I, I know. And that's half the thing. You believe in him. Okay. But belief looks like something, right? So you've got a thief to the left, a thief to the right. The thief on the left goes, how are you, man? I thought you were supposed to be the saviour. Get yourself down, save us. You're nobody. You're not God. You're not, you're not doing anything. You're not achieving anything here. But the other one on the other side, he says something completely different. And he turns to Jesus and he says, will you remember me when, I go to, when you go to your kingdom? Jesus says this, today you will be with me in paradise. Even if like you've sinned. Oh, yeah. Jesus, Jesus comes to save sinners. That's who he's here for. Not those who think they're cush. Not those who say they deserve it. <laughs> Not those who say they deserve it, but those who know that they've fallen short. Now you don't need to tell me you sin, but God knows it. Because yeah. it's him you've sinned against, right? That's bad, that. It's really bad. It's really, really bad. Can I tell you how terrible it is? Then we'll get to the good See, news. He died for us. He did. But he did that because you're a sinner. So, the, the truth is this, right? If you sin against me, it's not really that big a deal. It is a big deal before God, but if you sin against a police officer, it's more of a deal. Yeah. If you sin against a judge, it's more of a deal than it is against a police officer. If you sin against the king, it's a bigger of a deal than it is in the judge. When you sin against the king of kings and the lord of lords, that's serious. Serious. That, that's a terrifying thing. We're not talking about like a little god that you stick in your room like a Buddha. We're talking about... The one who spoke and this came into being, right? The one who knitted you together in your mother's womb. The one who just decides what happens right now. The one who gives us breath to talk, right? Him. Terrifying. He is the one. He is. But it is him who did all of that, who yet gave his life for you. No, 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 I'm listening. I know it usually happens. Yeah, I've seen this before, mate. Because people get uncomfortable with the gospel. I love it, mate. They get uncomfortable with the gospel. I don't want to go to hell. You're a, you're, a, you're a sinner who tries to do good stuff. Yeah. But, 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 listen, mate, mate. Listen, if I'm listening, she's listening, right? No, Please, no, Divin, no. take it from her. No, Divin, take it. You can go and sit on that chair over there. Hey, this is serious because this yeah. could be the day, right? I'm saying to this. Although your sins are many, yeah. there's not any that are too big for the forgiveness of God. What do we do then? You know when you when you go down to certain places and you see that street preacher, the last thing you want to do is sit and listen to him. Listen, I totally understand it, and the reason I understand that is because I did not want ever to listen to a street preacher, but God being God, I, I've turned into that street preacher. And the reason that we are here and find it 
important enough to destroy, to destroy your peace and quiet, to upset your stun bar a little bit, it's because there's something of urgency that needs to be talked about. And you might say, well, that's just urgent for you, but it's not urgent for me. But if what I'm saying is true today, Durham, it's urgent for absolutely every single person here. And if you would just take a second to look around us, there's a good couple of hundred, isn't there? Now, in the midst of those couple of hundred people, some people will pretend that I'm not here. Some people will not have ears to hear. Some people will be utterly disgusted by the fact that I'm preaching here. Some people will be irritated. But some people today will hear the truth. And the Bible says when you hear the truth and you know the truth, the truth's going to set you free. Often people say, you know, street preaching, it's just completely outdated. You shouldn't do it. Don't force your religion down people's throats. You do you. We'll do us. Leave it be. And we were just walking over the bridge over here, guys, and we were stopped by a lady and a friend. And she saw the sign. She said, she saw the sign that says, what is your relationship status with God? And she came up to me, she says, I want to tell you what my relationship status with God is. And she says, I thank God every single day that I'm here. Can you guys say you thank God every single day that you're here? No? No? That's the normative answer. But when I asked that, that's, that's great. Like, praise God that you thank God that you're here every single day. But then we have to ask the important question, well, which God are you talking about? Which God are you talking about? She says, well, I like to go to the spiritualist. I, like, I believe in that sort of stuff. And that begs the question then, you cannot be thanking God for who he says that he is because there's just some things, Durham, that aren't compatible. In spiritualism, witchcraft, the occult, new age just isn't compatible with the word of God. So her heart was to thank God. God bless you, brother. It's good to see you again. Her heart is to thank God, but really the God that she's thanking isn't the one of who he says he is. I remember you here last time, and by the grace of God, sir, the Lord's give you another opportunity to hear the word of God. And this lady heard the gospel. She heard the truth of Jesus Christ, and she repented, and she believed. She came up to me, and she said, what is it that I've got to do to be saved? What is it? Because I've searched everywhere. I've searched in the spiritualist because I just want to be close to my mother and my father. Durham, we're here to say to you today that just like that woman, that when you encounter Jesus, things get put in place. So we do not preach to you a works-based religion. We do not preach to you today falsehood. We preach to you today that you can encounter Christ and your sins can be forgiven. But the other part of that story is the guy that she was with. See, this woman, she was forgiven. She came to know Jesus. But the man that she was with, well, he was very different. See, this guy had suffered a little bit. And he said, I worship a God, and the God that I worship is the God of... And you know you can laugh, but the truth is, he's trying to find his hope, his peace, his satisfaction in external things that lead to destruction. And we asked him, do you want to know Jesus? He says, no. I said, do you believe in Jesus? He says, yes. I said the issue is not that you don't believe him, you just don't want him. Because when you come to Christ, you've got to leave some things behind, Durham. See, Jesus is all in all. He's not just something you pick up on a Sunday in this place. He's not just someone you pray to when you're desperate. Jesus is the King of Kings and he's the Lord of Lords. He's the one that gives you breath today. But the same people who love their life, who would do anything to hold on to their life, don't want the one that gave them it. See, this week the government have come out and they've put it out on their website that it would be a good idea that people would start to make rations control for themselves and their families just in case something bad happens. Just in case there's a famine. Just in case we go to war. Just in case there's a, a flood. I remember back in the day, you know, you would hear those people say those things and you would laugh at them. You would call them conspiracy theorists or you would call them doomsday preppers. But isn't it funny that when the government says something, people rush and they do mad things. Do you remember a few years ago when COVID happened? 
you guys, I'm not saying you guys, but people went crazy for toilet roll, didn't they? Do you remember that? You couldn't buy toilet roll for love nor money. I mean, what's all that about? But it's the same thing, that people love their lives so much, they want to hold on to their lives so much that they do really irrational things. It's called self-preservation. But I want to say this, that you can prepare for doomsday, you can prepare for a flood, you can prepare for whatever may well happen. But Durham, we have come down here and we've said all of that to say this, that there's something that you need to prepare for. Because every single person here has got an appointment. The Bible says in Amos to prepare to meet thy God. To prepare to meet God. And the most humbling thing, that no matter what you've got going on in this life right now, no matter what colour your skin is, no matter what your age is, no matter what your financial circumstances, no matter what, you're going to stand before God. And I'm asking you, are you prepared for that? When you look to the book of Amos, and here Amos was a minor prophet, that means not many people would say, oh, I've just been reading the book of Amos today, but Amos lived in a time Listen to this. Amos lived in a time where the rich were getting richer, the poor were getting poorer, and he stood there and he looked out at these places and he just saw so much immorality. He just saw so much injustice. He looked at God's people and he couldn't tell the difference what was going on. They were under a wicked king who said it was okay to worship and do what you want, you do you. So all these different people had all these different gods and he just worshipped them for fun. The people in the land at the time, they worshipped gods of the weather, they worshipped gods of sex, they worshipped gods of all sorts. Kind of like here today in Durham, isn't it? Just do what you want, there's no consequences. And Amos saw that and he saw the people who were in poverty and he saw the people who should know better and there's just a big gap, like what I said before. If you truly love people, you don't love them from a distance. If you truly love people and you're a Christian, you don't do it from in the four walls. Amos saw this. And the Lord told him to go and tell these people, to go and tell the people of the land to repent. Repent, you know, a lot of people don't like that word, but stop going that direction, have your mind changed. The word comes from metanoia, have your mind changed, a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of direction. See what the people were doing? They were leading their lives to destruction. And what we have to understand here is, although we can admit that we do bad things, that, that we sin, right? If one thing you people have got in common, all of us sin. All of us break the moral law. People say, the moral law doesn't exist. Okay, so is it okay to kick puppies? Of course it's not. Is it okay to lie and murder and steal? Of course it's not. Sometimes you can dumb your conscience down to convince yourself that it is, but it's not. So Amos was in this land and he went and he told the people, look, God is not pleased with what's going on here. You've got to repent. God said to the people, if you would turn to me, you shall live. If you would come to me, you shall find your life once again. See, God saw them at the temples. God saw them doing the good works. God saw all the things that they showed people externally, but God also saw their heart. See, God cannot stand hypocrisy. So Amos warned them on the Lord's behalf. And brother, do you know what happened? They completely ignored him. They wanted nothing to do with what God was saying. Much like what you see here today. People would much rather do what they're doing. Go the way that they're going. Ignore God. Ignore the gospel. Even though you probably know there's elements of truth in it, it doesn't, you don't think that. You'd do anything in your mind to try and convince yourself that it's not true, but you know because your conscience says so. They ignored what God was saying to them. And in a nutshell, God was saying this. You do know that I punished people for this before. And I chastise my people because I love them. But what you guys are doing, it's going to invoke my just righteous judgment. 
A lot of people say, I don't want to talk about God, especially the one in the Bible, because he's hateful. What you really mean by that is, you want to keep doing what you're doing and not be accountable for God. What you mean by that is, you'd rather have your standard of morality rather than the one who made all things. We want to be God. We want to be God. And you look to 2024 and how much time do we play God all of the same? You know I'm not lying to you, Durham. You know I'm not. If you continue down this path, it will lead to just righteous destruction. And they ignored him. Now when I was reading this, I looked into my life. And then I looked around my life, even today. And I looked at people here. And have you ever had people in your life that just can't take correction? You warn them about something and they continue on doing it and the, their life is just destroyed. They were just too stuck in the ways. You know, you say, look, guys, if you don't stop and get on the straight and the narrow, your life is going to be destroyed. Maybe it was the alcoholic in the family who just couldn't stop going to the bar, couldn't stop drinking. And you say to them, because you love them, if you don't stop, you're going to ruin your life. You'll die. Lo and behold, that's what happens. Maybe it was the gambler. And you say to them, look, mate, I love you so much, but if you continue gambling all this money away, you're going to ruin your life. You're going to ruin your family life. And what happens? Maybe it's the guy who continues to cheat on his wife, who was so faithful to him day in and day out, but he's just so consumed with lust that he just can't stop cheating. Maybe it was the internet pornography, or maybe it was the woman at the office. But you say to him, because you know, mate, you've got to stop because you're going to ruin your life. And what happens? Or maybe that's you. And just like that, God calls out to the people of Israel and then turn us here today that when you do that, you store up wrath. You store up wrath. God must punish that which is unrighteous. You know that it's right because he's so holy and he's so good. But on the other hand, because he loves us, he warns you. He warns you. He says, do not make me do this. You can turn around. You can take correction. You know what you're doing is wrong. Turn this way and I will wash your sin away. And then we've got to ask, what's our response? If you would only turn. Durham, if you would only turn. Anybody who's under my voice. If you would only turn to me, you would find your life. That's what God says. Because the path that you're on leads to judgment and destruction. And the Bible says that it's, 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 no, it's not God's desire to punish you, but you will refuse to turn. And then God says this. And I want to say this to you guys today. In Amos 4, God says this. You've turned away from me. You've not listened to the call of repentance from the endless prophets that have sent you away. And he says this. God says, prepare to meet your God. And we are not talking about the false gods of Buddhism, of Islam, of dead idols. We are talking about the Alpha in your Omega. God goes on to say this. Prepare to meet your God who is the Lord of hosts. What does Lord of hosts mean? It means the host of heaven's armies bow at his will. The most powerful, the most immeasurable power of righteousness and holiness is his. And it's him we mock, guys. It's him we turn away from. This isn't an ear tickler message. This is the truth. See, God is not a pussycat. He's righteously holy. He's so good. He says, I am the one who gives you breath. I am the one who weighs your thoughts. I am God. And you know when you're here, prepare to meet your God? That can do one or two things. If you are outside Christ, if you're an enemy of God, I say this to you in absolute love, that should terrify you. Seriously. That should terrify you to your very core. You should tremble over that. Because people say, when I stand before God, I'm going to tell him this, this and this. Listen, guys, I cannot stress this enough. When we stand before God, it's going to be not... It, you know, some things... Have you ever been frozen in fear before? 
like you've gone too far over to near the edge of a, a height and you go whoa and you fall you go whoa whoa, whoa. You, you try to settle yourself or you've been close to like um in a plane or something you get a little bit of turbulence you go, whoa you, you have a reality of how fragile you are when you stand before the creator of all things we're going to say nothing Prepare to meet your God. See, that can terrify you, but on the other side of that is the complete opposite. Oh my Lord, I cannot wait. It's like those two people on the bridge. That woman was like, I want to know God. Please tell me, I want to know. Tell me about Jesus. I want to be saved. And the guy was going, I don't want to know him. I don't want to see him. Prepare to meet God. In Durham, I ask you guys, honestly, I do. You can prepare for for floods and starvation, you can prepare for your marriage, you can prepare for your exams, you can prepare for all sorts. But I'm asking you, are you prepared to meet God? I mean, how do you even do that? How can you prepare to meet the Almighty? Because the truth is, everybody's got an appointment. You have, you have, you have, you have. And you know what it is? You're not going to be late. You're not going to be late. When God calls your number, you're up. everybody's got an appointment and how do you prepare to meet God do you make a list of all the good things that you've done do you try and conjure up the fact that what that guy's saying in Durham is a complete load of nonsense is not real I'm not going to meet God don't be so stupid which God one of the 4,200 religions no the God prepare to meet him and I say this if you catch anything that I've said here today if you do not have Christ on that day, if you're outside of Christ, you're going to be ill-prepared for that meeting. Guys, you cannot make a list of good works to try and satisfy God. It says it's like filthy rags. It doesn't matter how much peace you can conjure up on this side of eternity, it doesn't mean you're going to rest in peace. The way that you prepare to meet God is to do what God has said for you to do to prepare to meet him. And how God has asked you to prepare to meet him is to come through the Son. The Bible says that you must be born again. So going back to the very start of this, just to close this up, we know that all people are sinners because we've all sinned against God. That means we're all guilty. It doesn't matter how you wrap it up. It doesn't matter how much phone search history you clear. Nothing is hidden from the eyes of God. And when we really think about that, we're going to go and stand before the holies of holies. And this is the gap. And this is the chasm. And then there's heaven and there's hell. And then you're going to walk up to God. And then you're going to try and explain yourself. And what God is looking for from you guys is one thing. That you are in Christ that you have a robe of righteousness on because there's nothing that you can do, Durham. There's nothing that I can do that can satisfy holiness. Here's a question. How many good things do you have to do to be holy? It's just incomparable, isn't it? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did something for you so that you can prepare to meet God in absolute joy, in absolute expectation, in absolute confidence. You can have a hope in the future. You can know love. You can say, hey, I don't care what happens on this side of eternity because I know my God. And I want to tell you this, God is so good. God is so beautifully righteous. God is so holy. God is not like us. His ways are not our ways. And although our sins are many and we're complete opposite in nature when it comes to sin and righteousness, Jesus Christ gave his life for you that whilst you were yet sinners here today in Durham, that if you would turn to him, remember the word, repent, change your mind by the Holy Spirit and believe upon him, you're going to be saved. See, this isn't a workspace salvation. This isn't trying to balance the scales of eternity by being good enough. You are not saved by good works. You do good works because you are saved. Just like Amos, he stood in a world full of darkness. And I know you guys can see it. It's not just me, I've just got a microphone. I know you can see it, and maybe you can't see it in yourself, but you can certainly see it in other people. 
and there's many people trying to wake up. Oh, I'm awake. If your theology or your worldview of being awake and being enlightened is completely devoid of the one who is light, then I'm telling you, fast asleep. If you would turn to him, you will find your life. You see that in Amos, and you see that here today in Durham. Your tomorrow is not promised. And you can stand amongst many people who are promising many things. And I would say to you this, no matter where you are, no matter where you're finding your cause, your straight due north, if your due north is not Jesus Christ who loves you the most, who made you, who knows your mind in your heart, he's the one you're running away from. Forget me, forget the Christians guys, forget about that, forget about the church. I'm talking about Jesus. The church didn't save my soul, Jesus did. The church doesn't give me hope, although I love them, Jesus gives me hope. Behaviour modification isn't going to cut it. Because Jesus' robe of righteousness is on my shoulders. If you want hope, guys, it's not found in your own behaviour, good behaviour. How exhausting is that? Seriously, how exhausting is it? You've got many drums say this way, this way, this way, this way, but there's only one way. You know, in the centre of this, right in the middle, that's not in the middle, that's just me guessing. But in the centre of this, if you measure the words to the left and to the words to the right, give or take a few, you know what it says, guys? It says it's better to trust in God than to trust in man. That's what it says. It's better to trust in your creator than the creation. But actually what we see here on this side of eternity is the opposite, isn't it? It is. And we ask big questions as if God can't answer them. And we ask big questions of like, well, God, if you're so good, why the suffering? Oh, God, if you're so good and you don't want me to do certain things, why do you have different inclinations? Why are those people over there okay, but these people here aren't okay? Jesus says this. If you would only turn to me, you're going to find out. See, Jesus isn't looking for your behaviour modification. Your behaviour is modified to Jesus. Turn from your sin, which is the moral law breaking of God, and come to Jesus.